Welcome to today's panel discussion on transatlantic approaches to semiconductor investments, hosted by the Center for European Policy Analysis and the Polish Embassy. My name is Stephen Overley, and I host Politico's daily technology podcast, Politico Tech. At Politico, I've covered the, so I've covered the semiconductor supply chain since the U.S. and Europe became keenly aware of its vulnerabilities during the COVID-19 pandemic. I think we all remember how the global shortage of supply, uh, the global supply of semiconductors disrupted a multitude of sectors and contributed to record high inflation. Solving this problem has been framed as both an economic and national security priority. And I look forward to checking in on the progress with today's lineup of speakers. Let me briefly introduce them before we jump into our conversation. First, we have Hendrik Bourgeois, the Vice President of European Government Affairs at Intel. We have Lucinda Creighton. She's a senior fellow in the Digital Innovation Initiative at the Center for European Policy Analysis, our host. We have Adrian Elrod, who's the Director of External and Government Affairs for the CHIPS Program Office at the U.S. Department of Commerce. And finally, we have Yasa Tanki, the CEO and owner of Digital Core Design, which is based in Poland. Thank all of you for being here today. Um, I'd like to start with just a quick state of play on the semiconductor issue. You know, the Commerce Department is expected to award billions in subsidies to companies standing up microchip fabs here in the United States. In September, the European Chip Act, the European Chips Act, excuse me, entered into force. Lucinda, how would you describe this moment that we're in, in the transatlantic relationship as it relates to semiconductor strategy and investment? Uh, good question to kick off, I think, uh, and thank you. Uh, I mean, in a way, the US and the EU have been on a parallel track. I think um, I think we all identified the challenges that you've just outlined, um, uh, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and that has, um, I suppose, come into sharp focus from uh, a geopolitical as well as an economic point of view on both sides of the Atlantic. So, um, so I think uh, the U.S. administration and the European Commission uh, began to mobilize at around the same time and uh, began progressing the respective um, chip, CHIPS acts to try to respond to um, what was perceived to be um, significant supply chain insecurity. Um, so they haven't necessarily been... Um, how would I say joined up in the approach, but the uh, but the approaches haven't been all that dissimilar in the sense that ultimately, um, to a large extent, it boils down to subsidies. Some something that the European Union has been uh, really working very hard to uh, deter um, for the past thirty years, but now uh, is very much on board uh, with trying to deliver. Um, in in specific strategic areas of priority, um, and, and obviously particularly uh, semiconductors and chips. So, um, in that sense, um, the two are aligned, but there are differences, and of course, there have been tensions on occasion uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, as as they've sort of disagreed or or maybe been nonplussed with the approach um, that has been taken on either side of the the Atlantic. So there have been some political tensions. Um, but perhaps not as 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 much as might have been anticipated when this all kicked off. Excellent. Well, I, I definitely want to dive into some of those similarities and differences over the course of this conversation. Adrian, I'll, I'll come to you next, you know, because there's been an expectation, I think, that the U.S. CHIP Act awards would begin by the end of this year. What can you tell us about the status of those awards and, and the implementation of the CHIPS programs? Well, I think to um, answer that question, I really want to talk about the progress that we've made so far. So, Stephen, you're, you're obviously very well versed in uh, the progress of the Chips and Science Act. Congress passed it last year, last August, in a bipartisan manner. Um, I, we hired our first Chips um, staffer, Mike Schmidt, who still uh, runs the Chips Program Office. Um, three weeks later, we now have over 150 people on staff, um, and we've made a lot of progress. I also want to just talk about really quickly. Um, the number of applications that we've come in and the NOFOs that we put out. Um, we released our first funding opportunity in February of this year, and that was for large-scale, uh, leading-edge, mature note companies. Uh, we expanded that funding opportunity in June to include large-scale suppliers of CapEx projects at over $300 million. And then we also released a funding opportunity in September for smaller suppliers uh, with CapEx projects under $300 million. 
Uh, so we've made a lot of progress there. Um, we have received over 530 statements of interest. So basically when an applicant applies, we encourage them to file a statement of interest. Um, it really gives our team sort of a roadmap um, and a good view of where the activity is. You know, are there clusters that are starting to emerge? Um, you know, where is the growth here besides just the like natural hotbed areas of semiconductor activity like Arizona, Ohio, upstate New York, et cetera. Um, and then if you um, if you choose to apply, then you can you don't have to, but we encourage you to file a pre-application. And again, when you, when an entity files a pre-application, that creates a relationship with our investments vertical and our strategy vertical, so they can have an ongoing dialogue on whether or not they recommend you you um, apply for a full application. And then if you if they recommend that you file a pre I mean a, a full application, then you file a full application. Um, we've received over 120 pre-applications and applications. So that just shows you how far we've come. Um, and, you know, the fact that there's so much interest. And the interest, by the way, is not just in these regions where there are clusters. It is across the country. We've had SOIs from 42 states. So we've made a lot of progress so far. Now, what is next? Um, we will first issue a preliminary memorandum of terms. Um, that's called the PMT for the, for the, the acronym crowd here. Um, Secretary Romano has said on several occasions uh, that we will issue a PMT by the end of this year, um, and I have every reason to believe that that is the case. Uh, a PMT is where we basically say to an applicant, you will receive funding as long as your due diligence, the due diligence process shakes out uh, the way that we, we believe it will. Um, so we will have at least one PMT by the end of this year, um, and we will obviously that will start an ongoing process of the PMTs. And then again, once a, a, a PMT, an, an entity that, that is gone goes into a PMT, uh, once that due diligence process takes place, then we will go to the award phase. Uh, we have not started that phase yet because we haven't even, even issued a PMT, but that will all become part of the rolling you know, PMT award basis that will start very soon. So it sounds like in that, that process, then the awards uh, and, and money actually going out the door, so to speak, it is like looking like next year, perhaps. Is that is that fair to say? Absolutely, absolutely. And look, we want to get this money out the door as soon as possible. I don't have to tell you or or your listeners and viewers why that's important. Um, you know, there's a competitive. Um, you know, countries across the world are competing for this, um, and we also understand because of the supply chain disruptions during the pandemic, we simply have to have more leading edge uh, companies here in the United States that produce chips on American soil. Um, we produce 0% of the world's leading edge chips right now. We design a lot of them, but we produce 0% of those chips here in the United States. So it's in our best interest that we get this money out the door as quickly as possible. You know, a lot of it does depend on the strength of the applications that come in, the quality of those applications. Um, obviously, the, the, the higher quality of the application, the faster um, our team can work with that applicant uh, to get to a PMT and then to get get through the due diligence and get to an award phase. But we are moving as quickly as possible. I can tell you this team is working around the clock um, and it's in our interest and the American people's interest to get this money out the door as quickly as possible. Well, a common refrain that I've heard since the US and the EU first started talking about semiconductor subsidies is this idea that governments need to avoid a race to the bottom, that they want to avoid a situation where different governments are basically bidding against one another to give companies kind of ever larger incentives. Um, you know, Adrian, I just quickly want to come back to you here from the Commerce Department's perspective. I, I've heard a lot of talk, including from Secretary Raimondo, about the need to sort of avoid that kind of competition, to avoid that race to the bottom. From your perspective, I'd kind of like to understand what that means on a practical level, you know, how you make your investment decisions with that in mind. Look, Secretary Romano has made it very clear, and this is obviously an ethos that is um, that it, that is um, believed by the entire chips team here. That no single country can mine and manufacture semiconductors alone. It's just simply the the, the truth. This industry uh, is too large, and, and we cannot. We, we in the United States never believe that we're going to have a corner market on all the chips that we need. Uh, semiconductor supply chains are going to remain global, so international collaboration is critical to our collective success. Uh, we've also made it very clear that. Uh, we've appreciated the input and cooperation from our U.S. partners and allies. We'll keep working with our partners and allies to ensure that our strategies are aligned and that we are advancing our collective economic and national security. It's really, really important. And obviously, when we look at, um, you know, our allies in Europe, um, it's really important that we have a symbiotic uh, partnership that, that relies on each other for this. 
And by the way, with respect to pollen, we do welcome the announcement that it will be a site for new semiconductor back-end packaging, which pollen just announced, as that adds to the resilience and geographic diversity of this crucial part in the ecosystem. Our main goal here is to make sure that some of this advanced technology stays out of the hands of, of bad actors or actors who may not treat it with, with, the, uh, with, with the respect that it needs. But when it comes to our allies, uh, we want to have a global partnership. Um, it is critically important uh, that, we, that we work hand in hand with our allies uh, and that we grow the semiconductor activity in our, in our respective countries and regions together. Well, Hendrick, I'd like to bring you into the conversation now. You know, Intel is investing in the U.S. and in Europe. Um, how sort of clearly differentiated are the sort of subsidy strategies, investment strategies between the U.S. and Europe from where you sit? Well, I think, Eric, thanks for the question. I think there's a, a different framework across the Atlantic. Uh, in the European Union, uh, we basically have a two-tiered review system or application system. You first have to apply with national governments uh, for funds, subsidies, grants, incentives, uh, because there is no EU budget for incentives for manufacturing. And so it is the national budgets that are being tapped to, uh, and that requires, therefore, private investors to make applications in national capitals in the European Union. And once that is achieved, then there's a second tier of review with the European Commission. And the European Commission needs to apply EU state aid law, which is basically legislation geared towards ensuring that the single market is not distorted, that the aid that a member state provides is indeed necessary, that it's appropriate, that it's proportionate vis-a-vis other member states. And so in that respect, there's there's a difference, right? Because I, my understanding is that there's no type of equivalent of state aid legislation in the United States. Uh, and paradoxically, Europe has quite a bit of experience uh, and longstanding experience in applying state aid uh, reg legislation and regulation to ensure <laughs> a level playing field within the European Union. And so in that respect, there, there's a difference. Obviously, you know, the overall objective is the same, I think. I think both the United States and the European Union uh, see that they have common challenges in ensuring uh, that there's, uh, you know, that supply chain vulnerabilities are being addressed. Um, you know, today, uh, contrary to what was the case 40 years ago or 30 years ago, there's a very high concentration of supply of uh semiconductor technology in Southeast Asia, and that creates vulnerabilities. And both the United States and the European Union are trying to address that by allocating scarce public financial resources to create the necessary incentives for manufacturing locally. And so in that respect, there's 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 total similarity, right? And the only difference I would say <laughs> is that unfortunately, as a European, I must say that we're, you know, in, in Europe, it's it's more difficult because Europe doesn't, it's not a fiscal union. You know, there's there's a lack of Europe scale at the European Union level because we have to tap into various smaller national budgets. And the, you know, the EU CHIPS Act, contrary to the US CHIPS Act, does not create new financial resources. There's no, you know, federal, EU federal uh, amount of, of money that can be dispersed to, to private companies. It remains uh, a, a national issue. And so in that respect, I think, you know, uh, the, United, the United States has a bigger firepower to allocate than, uh, than, the, than the European Union. Well, listen, I'll we'll bring you in here real quick, which, you know, you made your comment earlier that the U.S. and Europe there's differences in their, in their approach. And, and I think really the mentality, too, when it comes to to these subsidies, what stands out to you here is the biggest difference um, between the approach the U.S. is taking and the EU is taking, and to, does that create a, a conflict or a tension between the two? And um, I think, well, I think if you go back to sort of uh, even even pre-pandemic when uh, Europe was talking a lot um, over the past five, six, seven years about. Uh, digital sovereignty and about strategic autonomy. 
Um, Europe was very clearly giving the indication that this was going to be about focusing on subsidizing uh, generally tech capability in Europe that would be to the detriment of other regions, including the United States, and would be very much about favoring and supporting indigenous European business um, and industry. That that sort of outlook has changed. And the CHIPS Act, I, I, I mean, as we're already beginning to see it manifest, even though um, the direct funding, which as Hendrik has said, is, is relatively very small, the uh, R&D funding that is directly uh, coming from central EU funds, um, uh, that is that is not um, uh, not necessarily excluding um, uh, opportunities for uh, for American industry, for example. Uh, when you look at the 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 the, the, hu the huge potential. Uh, member state subsidies, direct subsidies to industry, um, they are going to and they will go to the established players on the global stage, um, TSMC, Intel and others. And that's already uh, that's already coming to fruition even before um, even before the CHIPS Act had been finally negotiated. Uh, member state governments were doing um, were negotiating with with those companies to to um, uh, to secure uh, investments in in individual member states, Germany, of course, being uh, to the forefront in that. Um, so there is no discrimination against um, non-European uh, industries, and that's obviously uh, by its nature essential because we don't have big players in Europe. So I think there's a little bit of a reality check, perhaps, in in how uh, how Europe has gone about this. So um, the sort of I think the 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 almost protectionist uh, approach that was envisaged. Um, you know, five or six years ago, um, that that clearly has been completely dropped. Uh, there are some distinctions between the EU and US Chips Acts um, to receive support for manufacturing in Europe. Um, you are expected to have a first of a kind facility. Um, so, you know, the the EU Chips Act is is really heavily focused on uh, investments in next generation chips. Um, that's a little bit different to the U.S. approach, um, which doesn't have uh, quite the same requirements. Um, and uh, well, uh, there are similarities, of course, as well. The U.S. Um, requires, as I understand it, um, grant applicants uh, to invest in workforce training. And the e EU is trying to follow uh, with that approach uh, by supporting education training um, and upskilling and reskilling. Um, and that's that's a, that's certainly a part of um, of the um, approach at European level, um, um, but it's not a requirement. It's not a condition uh, of subsidi subsidies. Um, uh, and I think you know overall, uh, and and Hendrik has alluded to this as well. You know the EU structure is probably more complex because it's not a federal. Uh, budgetary approach. Um, so it's just more complex, it's more nuanced, and different member states have different approaches. And the one thing I would say, um, which, you know, uh, is a challenge, I think, for the European single market, because the European single market has spent 23 years, or 30, 30 plus years, um, trying to create a level playing field for investment and innovation and, and uh, industrial progress in Europe, um, and has has really try to ensure that, you know, peripheral, peripheral member states, uh, large core member states, small countries could all sort of benefit from uh, European, European prosperity and growth and, and innovation, um, you know, by its very nature, reintroducing subsidies to uh, the industrial landscape in Europe on a big scale absolutely favours the large member st states because they are the ones with the budgets um, at national level to be able to provide and offer these subsidies, whereas the smaller uh, and more and poorer and more peripheral member states are not. So that's a new challenge for the European Union, which I think needs to be acknowledged and needs to probably be addressed. Well, um, I think that's a great segue to talk about Poland in particular as sort of an interesting example of how this policy is playing out. You know, the Polish government seems to be trying to put a stake in the ground when it comes to building out its domestic semiconductor industry and, and really sort of using this opportunity uh, and all of this uh, attention on this industry to, to expand its own sector. You know, Jacek, you've operated your company in, in Poland for a long time. 
uh, what, how would you assess the approach that's being taken right now to attract new chip makers to Poland? Uh, you know, we are uh, in Poland, we are building our semiconductor industry from the scratch and then all the industries uh, now under development. Uh, so um, everything what we are doing is 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 quite new for, for our industry, for our academic. And uh, the whole industry is in Poland is now uh, under development from, and we are developing it from the scratch, starting from education, uh, through the design services. And finally, and hopefully, we will uh, we will achieve the, the the production ability at least in the in the fabs in located in the Germany or, or other parts uh, in Europe. Uh, what is strong in Poland that we have a very talented engineers and uh, able to to design and focusing on on the development of um, new innovative uh, solutions. And uh, from my perspective, um, the most important aspect in, in such cooperation would be the possibility of um, implementing an, um, of uh, common norms and, and standards, uh, especially in area of um, development of, uh, of a new and uh, broadly understood the cybersecurity or uh, functional safety. Uh, it is especially necessary and uh, needed in, in new technologies, uh, in automotive industry, uh, in, in, in any area of development of, of uh, the new technologies of, and the new products. Um, you know, my, I represent the, the, the company from the SME sector. So from my perspective, um, the, um, the challenges and, and opportunities given, given by the, the uh, CHIP Act uh, is a strong opportunity for, for our country and for our companies to, to start development of new technologies, new chips, and uh, not only to, to make the designs and provide the solutions for the, the, the biggest players on the market, but also to start development uh, of our own technology, of our own products uh, under our own brand. Well, um, Hendrik, I'll, I'll come to you because, you know, Intel announced earlier this year would invest, I believe it's 4.6 billion in a, a new facility in, in Poland. Um, and there was a quote from Intel CEO, Pat Gilsinger, that sort of caught my eye where he said that Intel had not originally really been considering Poland, but was drawn to it by Poland's persistence and, and its sort of eagerness to, to get a deal done. Um, I guess there's a couple of ways to look at that. But, uh, you know, what question I had was, you know, is, is this an example of what we were talking about earlier with a potential race to the bottom where you have these countries all sort of bidding for, for Intel and, you know, whoever puts the most money on the table wins? I wish it were that simple. Uh, that's obviously not the case. <laughs> you know, uh, first of all, the semiconductor industry is incredibly capital intensive. Uh, I don't know of any other industry that is so complex and so capital intensive. And so, yes, it is very important to obtain partnerships from governments uh, when a private investor wants to set up a manufacturing site. Uh, but those decisions are incredibly complex. And there's a lot of other factors that are taken into account before uh, an investment decision is made, before a site selection is made, and it goes from you know, uh, as you can imagine, you know, the availability availability of infrastructure, the availability of land, you know, the, the amount of land of you know volume is just is just uh, very significant. Um, semiconductor manufacturing is also very uh, sensitive. It's very complex. You need to take into account, uh, for instance, uh, the, you know, the fact that you don't have train stations that are near to avoid vibrations. Uh, there's there's uh, you know, more important things like the availability of skilled workers and talents is incredibly important. Relationships uh, with key research institutes is important because you need ongoing in innovation to support uh, going forward, the manufacturing operations that, that you're investing in. 
Um, and then last but not least, uh, I think you also need, you know, a broader ecosystem that supports you. So, you know, when we looked at Poland, we looked at a wide variety of factors. Uh, and obviously, I think what my CEO, Pat Gelsinger, was alluding to was one of those elements, which is perhaps, uh, you know, the eagerness of of the uh, administration that you're dealing with to resolve, as you can imagine, uh, very important bottlenecks and, 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 and difficulties that occur in such a selection process because of its complexity, right? And so, you know, the more you have um, representatives of an administration that are, you know, proactive, that are trying to find solutions, that anticipate problems, and that are flexible in trying to find uh, solutions around those problems, I think is also, you know, a, a factor that uh, that private investors will will take into account. Well, Sandra, you know, you were saying earlier that there's this concern around the e the EU approach where you know the depending on the the size of the national budget of a member you know they may or may not sort of be better positioned to you know get some of these uh semiconductor investments i wonder where you sort of see the developments in poland sort of fitting into that you know on the one hand you obviously have a country that is trying to take advantage of and and sort of seize this moment around semiconductors on the other hand, I, I I can't say I know uh, Poland's GDP, but I, I don't I don't think it's quite uh, the level of some other larger you know EU member states. So how do you how's how would you assess kind of the the Polish example in that context? Yeah, I mean, I think I think Hendrik's point is a fair one. It, it doesn't. I mean, subsidies obviously are very irresistible uh, for for global multinationals. Um, at the same time, you have to have the other factors there. You have to have, you know, the the willingness to solve problems, the the bottlenecks, um, as mentioned. Um, often, you know, for for these types of lar large scale manufacturing operations, you have um, significant administrative and planning issues that that can be really challenging in a lot of European member states. Um, and you have the talent and and uh, labor force issues. You know, having that supply of um, of workforce is really important too. So there are different factors, I think. Um, I, you know, one of uh, but having said that, of course, um, um, you know, the the wealthier, larger member states um, will have the edge because they can put put down you know billions uh, and billions of euro, um, and and certainly we have seen already. Uh, that Germany is way ahead of every other European member state on the Chips Act, and will be, and will continue to be, because of its size and because of its GDP. It's just it's 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 very difficult for others to to compete. And and France is number two, and and that's the way it will be so long as we're 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 in the business of of dealing with subsidies. Um, I think one of the interesting and really important aspects of the European Chips Act is. Pillar one, it's the research and development and innovation pillar, which is the direct EU funding, if you like. Um, and that is, um, I think, uh, under the current CHIPS Act, um, too small. Um, uh, I think there's 3.3 billion allocated to R&D and a further 2 billion that's um, part of a so-called CHIPS fund. It's it's relatively small, um, uh, you know, as as a as a proportion of the of the forty three billion that is overall part of the the proposed um, package, uh, and I think that that's where the opportunity lies. Uh, for well, for two things: one, um, to create opportunities for um, a perhaps more geographically uh, balanced approach um, for the European Union uh, to to developing the the semiconductor ecosystem in Europe, but but secondly and very importantly. Uh, for ensuring that uh, that Europe continues to be at that sort of high value end of the supply chain. And, you know, our, uh, Europe um, as a part of the global uh, semiconductor ecosystem um, is only at 10 percent in terms of uh, manufacturing capacity. The aspiration of the CHIPS Act is to achieve 20 percent. I'm not sure that anybody believes that Europe will achieve that by the, the target date of 2030. I mean, given the you know the 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 slow nature of rolling out these massive multi billion euro projects. I think it's probably unrealistic. Um, but there's a huge potential and huge capacity for Europe to continue to 
really add value and to develop intellectual property and to develop that sort of value add to the supply chain. So it's not just about, um, you know, developing these vast um, manufacturing facilities. Um, They're important and it's clearly a political objective of the European Union. But from an economic point of view, I think it's important that we that we don't sort of forget about uh, where Europe actually really has its strengths, which is um, is developing the new technologies and being innovative. And I think that's where the opportunity that Yasek has talked about as well in terms of for, you know, for disruptor companies, for small innovative players to get on the pitch and to scale and grow in Europe. And, and that should really be a big part of the ambition for the CHIPS Act. Well, I, I kind of want to talk about, you know, the, the longer term business and investment environment for the US and EU when it comes to semiconductors. I mean, as we've said, you know, this is a very capital intensive business and there are particularly a lot of upfront costs to building and establishing these fabs and the subsidies programs in the US and EU seem to be primed for helping with those upfront costs. But I guess the question to me and, and Yasek, I'll, I'll come to you first on this, which is, you know, what are the US and EU not doing now that perhaps they should be? to sort of make the longer term, you know, investment and labor environment more appealing? Yeah, it's it's a good question. You know, I, I have a quite good and, and long relationship with American companies. Uh, my company is is focused on, on um, designing services. So so we are involved in, in process of creation of, of new integrated circuits. Uh, doing the, the projects for, for the global and major players. Uh, but so far, uh, we didn't have a, and, and we don't have an, an infrastructure for, pro, for production of, of uh, semiconductors. So everything what, what is done by the companies like, like, like mine in, in Poland is to provide the design services. I, I, I suppose that um, uh, the long-term relationship would be uh, focused on uh, on creation of design centers here in Poland, and we can uh, do and uh, prepare some prototypes which can could be scaled up to for the mass production in in the new facilities and the, the new fabs created in in, in Europe. Um, yeah, but but so far so far we base on on our human resources on on talented engineers, and the the, the innovative and innovations created by by our engineers. Um, Hendrik, uh, you know the we mentioned Intel's investment in Poland. Um, I know there's been another uh, facility being built in Germany. I believe a few in the U.S. I'm, I'm sure there's others I'm missing. The, the point is obviously Intel is investing a lot um, and has, has talked about that quite a bit. So does that mean that the, the business environment is already appealing and, and right for investment as it stands now, or is there more that needs to be done? Well, certainly we see a growing demand for the type of uh, semiconductors that we manufacture, which are the, the advanced semiconductors, the leading edge semiconductors, because these are chips that are going to be used for new technologies, for artificial intelligence, for 5G, 6G technology, for high performance computing. And so we see the demand for these types of uh, chips and for this type of technology growing. And so that's why we think this is an important and uh, significant uh, and, and smart investment decision. Uh, so, uh, and yes, you know, uh, we've been, uh, significantly engaging in, in in manufacturing investments, particularly in Europe uh, and in the United States. Um, I think that's uh, that's important. But if I one 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 thing I wanted to do is get back a little bit to what what Jacek and, and Lucinda were saying. You know the you know there is the 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 the, the semiconductor manufacturing space is very diverse, right? There there is no no such thing as one single homogeneous uh, type of or, or or way of manufacturing semiconductors. It usually involves, you know, research and development. Then you go to design, and after design, you have to think about, you know, 
front end manufacturing, which is basically the manufacturing of wafers. And after the wafers, you need to assemble, you need to test. Uh, there's uh, there might be the need to uh, to package the chips. Uh, other industries will create substrate that goes into the chips production. So there's various pieces in the manufacturing supply chain, and I think. You know, I think it's important to think about that when when you think about subsidy races and when you think about you know the strengths of this or that country or this economy and that economy. Um, you know, there's there's obviously strength and diversity, uh, and 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 both from the European Union side, where Lucinda is basically saying, look, let's let's be careful about you know uh, a subsidy race within the European Union. Uh, I agree with that, but you know, in reality. A company like Intel has been investing in various types of, uh, of in various areas within the semiconductor manufacturing chain in the European Union. Assembly testing in Poland, uh, plant wafer fabrication in in Germany, and 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 the important thing is, you know, I also have an example of why smaller European member states can benefit uh, from uh, investments even without the Chips Act because we've been, you know, investing invested in Ireland since 1989 and in Ireland we have a, a huge site in in Dublin uh, and we've invested over 30 billion euros since we 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 set up that site back in 1989 um and so so I'd say look you know and that's also true I think also for the transatlantic relationship I think it would be you know unsustainable for a company like Intel to pursue a you know a, 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 a you know, a subsidy race to the bottom or to the top, depending on where you, what your perspective is, because, you know, I think it's very important for both the U.S. and the, and the European Union to think about complementarity aspects uh, and making sure that there's a, a true transatlantic partnership in, trans, in, uh, in semiconductor manufacturing to address a common, uh, a common challenge. You know, I think, you know, when people talk about subsidy races, they think about, I think, you know, let's make sure we don't overcompensate. Let's make sure we don't provide too many incentives, right? As a simple result of this this competition. In reality, I think the the real question is, you know, will the West be able to level the playing field? Uh, you know, if you look, for instance, at you know what China is doing in in the Made in China 2025 program, I think they're allocating just the central Chinese government 150 billion dollars or its equivalent. Just to semiconductor manufacturing. So you know, this is this is the I think the optic that uh, that is important to and the perspective that is important to to uh, to take in mind when when thinking about you know subsidy races and thinking about also the diversification of of investments in the United States within the European Union and between the European Union and the United States. Well, I have two more topics I'd like to get in with our remaining minutes, and, and one builds on exactly what you were just saying, Hendrik, which is. You know, the, this competition with China, you know, at large, and really a lot of these investments sort of being viewed, I think, in that context. I, I think it's important to bring in here, at least briefly, some discussion of critical minerals, right? You know, this is a key part of the supply chain for semiconductors. It's one that's not directly addressed by the subsidies programs, and yet it's a challenge that both the U.S. and the EU have, where they're still very largely dependent on China for critical minerals. Um, Lucinda, I, I'd just like to come to you on this. Um, you know, are there, uh, is there sort of a, a joint approach that the US and EU can take to really address that vulnerability of, of being dependent on China for these critical minerals? Um, yeah, look, I, 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 think that, I think it goes absolutely hand in hand with, um, with our transatlantic approach to uh, semiconductors and and indeed to um, green technologies and the renewable economy and so on, I mean all of these all of these um, uh, priorities are interlinked and they are common priorities and common goals. Um, so we're probably not doing enough in terms of being joined up. Um, uh, obviously, we have various channels between the European Union, and I think we should not forget the UK in all of this as well, unfortunately, no longer a member of the European Union, but still a, a, an important European country that 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 is part of, of this uh, dialogue and has to be part of this dialogue as well. Um, but there is enormous 
um, not just an opportunity, but I think an absolute necessity for for, for Europe and uh, the US to work together on this. The TTC is is a platform for that to happen. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the results have been underwhelming to date in terms of really um, building uh, common approaches, really this was achieving an understanding of um, the priorities on both sides of the Atlantic. They're not a million miles a- apart, um, but for some reason it has proven, I think, to be difficult to sort of forge a common uh, path together. Um, may- maybe because, you know, uh, both European political leaders and uh, and likewise in the US, you know, and understandably and rightly are focused on, you know, delivering and being seen to deliver, uh, you know, jobs and investment domestically. I mean, we have all become a little bit more nativist in how we package and sell these things. Um, but I think um, when it comes to, you know, hugely important strategic priorities like critical uh, minerals that we are looking at building new partnerships globally, um, that we are doing so together uh, and that we are very, uh, we're doing so, you know, conscious of, um, the threat that that is posed by China um, and and other authoritarian regimes around the world upon whom we do not wish to be dependent. Um, so there is an absolute common objective here between Europe and the US, and maybe we need to just work a little bit harder to um, to forge a common path. Well, um, Adrian, I'd just like to come to you for the final word here, which we mentioned the TTC, which is the Trade and Technology Council. I, I think one of the next uh, moments we're watching for in this US-EU relationship is the next meeting of the TTC, which is expected here shortly. Um, back in May, I know they announced sort of an early warning system on semiconductors, and there's been some progress out of the TTC on these issues. Um, I wonder if you might give us, Adrian, a sense of either what to expect from this upcoming meeting or, or what we should look for you know, in terms of how the US and EU can continue to align on these issues. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the TTC is a very important um, convening so that we can, the U.S. and the EU um, being, you know, top allies can work together on making sure that it's in our best interest, uh, the growth of the semiconductor industry is taking place in both our country and in, in the EU. EU. Uh, and, you know, look, we we're proud of the work we've already done together on this. We've completed a joint early warning mechanism, as you just mentioned, for semiconductor supply chain disruptions and a transparency mechanism for sharing of information about public support provided to the semiconductor industry. Um, And the cooperation between the United States and the EU is reinforcing the success of our respective efforts to promote semiconductor supply chain. So um, I think we're going to be able to, when we come together, we're going to discuss common elements of our public support frameworks in order to improve effectiveness and, and shared lessons. But the bottom line is, we see our relationship with the EU, the United States, as when it comes to semiconductor industries and obviously trade across the board as imperative. If the EU succeeds um, in terms of semiconductor growth, uh, so does the United States and vice versa. So this is a really great convening. Um, it, it, it solidifies that partnership and really provides a forum in which both the EU and the United States can come together and, and have these discussions. Well, that is all the time we have today. I really thank all of our panelists for being here. I'm I'm sure we could revisit this conversation many times uh, over the next year as all of these investments start to come to fruition. And I want to thank you all for tuning into today's conversation on transatlantic approaches to semiconductor investments. This has been hosted by the Center for European Policy Analysis and the Polish Embassy. Be sure to visit SIPA.org and follow SIPA's social media accounts to stay up to date on their latest policy analysis and upcoming events. And thank you again for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.